evidence of an advanced civilization in Egypt before the pharaohs? Well, we have to revert back to the Emerald Tablets again, written by the Atlantean Thoth, who was one of the first deities of ancient Egypt. And he claims that he's buried his spaceship under a sphinx in a plateau of pyramids. We've also read an article stating that it's believed that the Giza pyramids were, bu were built by Thoth, the Atlantean, or Hermes Trismegistus. This is what the Sphinx looked like about a hundred years or so ago. You can see that it was buried up to its neck in sand. It also has so much weathering that they, they believe it could have been built around the uh, last ice age or before the last ice age over 13,000 years ago. There is no other place on earth like Egypt's Giza Plateau. Anyone with even a slight interest in history and civilization is aware of this fact. For on this plateau there stands the Great Pyramids and their sculpted guardian, the Great Sphinx. Although there are plenty of theories, no one really knows who built the Giza Pyramids or carved the Sphinx or when they were constructed. Any statement as to who built them or why they were built is pure theory. In light of all various theories concerning these mysterious structures, I don't think the theoretical nature of the pyramid builders can be emphasized enough. What stands out at Giza more than anything else is not only the magnitude of the construction of the pyramids, but the internal design of the Great Pyramid, three chambers of which one is subterranean and their connecting passageways. The passageways that lead to, uh, leads to the so-called King's Chamber rises to the height of 36 feet. On the other hand, all other passageways are, were not tall enough to accommodate the average man or woman. There's also the unique configuration of the King's Chamber, as well as the Queen's Chamber. Both of these contain two shafts, one in each side of the chamber. The Queen's Chamber contains a corbelled niche built into its east wall, and the King's Chamber ceiling is composed of five granite slabs stacked one on top of the other. Now, why these chambers were constructed in this manner is unknown. The official theory is that the pyramids were tombs and that King Khufu kept changing his mind where his burial chamber was to be placed and thus the reason for three chambers in the Great Pyramid. However, in comparison to typical Egyptian burial methods, the Mastaba and the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, the Giza pyramids and particularly the Great Pyramid do not fare well within the Egyptian concept of a tomb. The ancient Egyptian view of the afterlife. The Egyptians believed in an afterlife and the tomb was an important part of that belief. As the tomb of King Tutankhamun testifies, the deceased chamber of internment was to be decorated with art and filled with that person's possessions. Why they practiced this ritual was not for superstitious reasons, as one might suspect. It was practical, according to their beliefs, and aimed at preventing that person's energy or spirit from being reabsorbed into nature's spiritual force. For the ancient Egyptians, Ba animated a living person, whereas Ka was the energy emanating from that person. Although not an exact analogy, the Ka and the Ba are what traditional Western thoughts might refer to as spirit and soul. Another important aspect of Egyptian belief represented immortality, the Ankh, depicted as the crested ibis. The Ka, represented in art by upstretched arms, was believed to be the part of man's consciousness and energy, man's spirit or inner quality, that related to the immediate world. It's part of us connected to the physical body, where it lived, its possessions as well as the people he or she was acquainted with. The Ka can be likened to one's personality, which upon death is separated from the body and naturally seeks a way to once again take form. The Ba, represented by a winged human head or sometimes a human-faced bird, represents the part of consciousness that is immortal. When someone passes, passed away, it was their goal as well as the hope of the family that the deceased's Ka would seek a way to remain united with their Ba. 
To help accomplish this eternal union, the possessions of the deceased were gathered together by the family and placed in the tomb with the mummified body. Mummification prevented the body from decomposing and returned to the soil of the earth, whereas the tomb with the deceased possessions served as the home for the Ka. As a result, the Ka maintained its identity in the spiritual world and could seek out its Ba in order to achieve Anka, which resulted in the resurrection and glorified form of the deceased body, the limits of an earthly realm, beyond the limits of the earthly realm. The pyramids and the concept of the Egyptian tomb, like the pharaonic tombs carved in the Valley of the Kings, Royal mastabas built during the early dynasties, some as early as 3000 BC, were also designed with home in mind, as that home relates to the person's ka. Case in point, from the 6th dynasty, Mereruka's mastaba was crafted in mason-like, mansion-like proportion, with 32 rooms, and adorned with statues and art depicting, for example, scenes of wildlife along the Nile River. The traits of Egyptian domestic life, so beautifully incorporated into the designs of their tombs, are not found in the Giza pyramids. The Giza pyramids contain no art or hieroglyphics of any kind whatsoever, very uncharacteristic of Egyptian tombs. So why is it, in the case of the Giza pyramids, are generally considered to be tombs of 4th dynasty pharaohs? The reason is because of an association of the Giza complex with another development 10 miles south at Saqqara, where the Egyptians really did build tombs as pyramids. At Saqqara, in 1881, the French Egyptologist Gaston Maspero, 1846-1916, discovered that the subterranean chamber of the Pepi I Pyramid, second ruler of the 6th dynasty, was engraved with hieroglyphics. Over the course of subsequent explorations, it was discovered that a total of five pyramids in Saqqara also contained inscriptions from the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and, uh, and 8th dynasties of the Old Kingdom. In 1952, Dr. Samuel Mercer, 1879 to 1969, professor of Semitic languages and etymology at the University of Toronto in Canada, published a complete English translation of the pyramid texts in the volume of the same name. According to Mercer, the pyramid texts contain, quote, words to be spoken, and quotes, concerning funerary rituals, magical formula, and religious hymns, as well as prayers and petitions on behalf of the deceased king. With the pyramids of Saqqara being confirmed as tombs, the associative logic came to be that all pyramids must be tombs. Furthermore, since there are two cemeteries, Mastaba Fields to the east and west of the northmost Giza pyramid, assuming that all pyramids are tombs was a likely conclusion. However, the condition of the Saqqara pyramids, most of which are believed constructed after the Giza pyramids, poses serious problems in this logical association. Of the pyramids of Saqqara, only Jossar's step pyramid is in good condition, although not really a true pyramid. The step pyramid was originally a mastaba that was modified into a pyramid, and all other pyramids of Saqqara, most of which belong to the 5th and 6th dynasties, are in ruins today and resemble mounds of rubble. According to consensus of Egyptologists, Djoser's step pyramid at Saqqara was constructed during the 3rd dynasty and was the forerunner of the 4th dynasty pyramids on the Giza plateau. After pyramid development at Giza, for whatever reason, the focus of pyramid building shifted back to Saqqara. The Great Pyramid, a device. The easily observable and obvious differences in the Giza pyramids and the Saqqara pyramids, which were all supposed to have been built during the same era, are a problem. Clearly, the construction techniques as well as materials for the Giza pyramids were different than those of Saqqara, or else we would expect pyramids of both sides to have stood the test of time in a similar manner, but they did not. The important point is why. Did the engineers and construction workers of the Old Kingdom not pass along their methods from the 4th to the 5th dynasty? It seems they did not, which is a very curious occurrence given 
the stability of Egyptian civilization. It may also be the case that the fourth dynasty Egyptians did not build the Giza pyramids. No other pyramid in Egypt, the word for that matter, is like the Giza pyramids, and in uh, the world for that matter, and in particular to uh, the Great Pyramid. Additionally, there is no direct evidence to support the claim that the Great Pyramid or the other Giza pyramids were tombs, nor is there any record left by its builders as to what it was for or when it was built. This creates a problem of explanation. If the Great Pyramid was not a tomb, then what was it? A mystical temple for initial ritual or a public works project designed to unify the country? Or was it something else entirely? Theories are abundant, but the only theory I'm aware of that covers all aspects of the Giza Pyramid's interior design is Christopher Dunn's theory that it was a device. According to Dunn, the Great Pyramid was a machine for producing power by converting tectonic vibration into electricity. There are a number of reasons to accept Dunn's anal analysis. First, he explains the interior design and all other evidence within the Great Pyramid in a cohesive manner. Second, he demonstrates the technical skills required to accomplish precision construction. Third, Dunn's experience, expertise, and career is in the preci precision fabrication and manufacturing industry, which makes him a, unique qualified, a uniquely qualified expert to a professional opinion on the techniques and tools of Giza build pyramid builders. The fact is, modern construction companies could not build the Great Pyramid today without first inventing specialized tools and techniques in order to deal with blocks of stone that vary in weight from 10 to 15 tons. Such an endeavor would be on a magnitude equivalent to building a hydro electric dam or nuclear power station requiring tens of billions of dollars in resources. Although our modern economy is different than that of the ancient world, the resource required now as compared to then is the same. The stone must be quarried, moved, and workers must be paid. The fact that the extremely large amount of resources were dedicated to Giza pyramid development over a long period of time demands, in my opinion, that pyramid building was utilitarian and not for any fourth dynasty pharaonic vanity of having the largest headstone in the world. Prehistory, evidence, and perspective. For me, the evidence clearly tells a very different story of early dynastic Egypt. Something around 3000 BC, the establishment and growth of permanent settlements in the lower Nile Valley led to the development of civilization. Why Giza and the surrounding area were chosen as the focal point for the early dynastic Egypt was because civilization had been there before, as the three pyramids and the Great Sphinx testify. Without knowing what the pyramids were designed for, the early Egyptians also assumed they must have been tombs. And as a result, they rejuvenated the Giza Plateau and turned it into a necropolis, then expanded to Saqqara where they built tombs in pyramid form, albeit of lesser quality and not brandishing the skills the original builders of the Giza pyramids demonstrated. Pyramid building, even the smaller ones in Saqqara, was resource intense so the Egyptians reverted to burying their nobility in the traditional mastaba. This scenario, which calls for an earlier civilization with advanced technical skills, poses another problem. It does not fit the standard model of history. However, the notion that an earlier civilization existed does not rest on the Giza pyramids alone. There is also the Sphinx, which in 1991 was geologically dated to be 7 and 9,000 years old by the team of John Anthony West, and geologist Dr. Robert Shosh. Add to that the megaliths of Napta Playa in southwestern Egypt, which is believed to have been a star viewing diagram, according to astrophysicist Dr. Thomas Brophy, that relates not only the distance from the Earth to the belt stars of Orion, but their radial velocities as well. Another head scratching discovery is a 1,260 uh, ton foundation stones of the Baalbek Temple, west of Beirut in Lebanon, one of which was left in its quarry. Clearly, history has its secrets, but there is enough evidence to validate as theory that, theory that uh, civilization is much older than we have previously believed. 
History, according to the ancient Egyptians themselves, confirms this. According to the Papyrus of Turin, which is a complete list of kings up to the New Kingdom before Menes, before that is 3000 BC, 5000 years ago, the quote, Venerables Shemshu Hor reigned 13,420 years, reigns up to Shemshu Hor 23,200 years. End quote. These two lines in the king's list are explicit. According to their documents, the total years of Egyptian history goes back 36,620 years. The argument that the years in the king's list do not represent actual years but some other shorter measurement of time seems more of an attempt to explain away that uh, than to explain. The ancient Egyptians employed a sophisticated calendar system that involved a 365-day year, which was periodically corrected through the predictable and cyclical nature of the star Sirius. Every 1,461 years, the heliacal rising of Sirius marked the beginning of the new year. A single Sirius cycle corresponds to 1,461 years. The heliacal rising of Sirius marked the beginning of the new year. A single Sirius cycle corresponds to 1,461 years, where each year is equivalent to 365.25 days. 365 and a quarter days. In essence, the marking of the new year at the heliacal rising of Sirius was the ancient Egyptians' leap year. Of course, determining the length of Sirius' cyclical nature requires stellar observation over thousands of years, which means the origins of pharaonic Egypt or its source of knowledge must originate in the remote past. Late 20th century Egyptologist Walter Emery seems to have agreed in principle that the origins of ancient Egypt date well into prehistory. Emery believed that ancient Egyptian, uh, Egypt's writing, written language was beyond the use of pictorial symbols even during the earliest dynasties and that signs were also used to represent sounds along with the numerical system. When hieroglyphics had been stylized and used in architecture, a cursive script was already in common use. His conclusion was, quote, that all this shows that the written language must have had a considerable period of development behind it, of which no trace has yet been found in Egypt, end quote. Ancient Egyptian religion also testifies to the considerable period of development, their religion, which is more of a philosophy of nature and life than it is a religion, is based on a level of sophistication that, in all respects, appears more scientific than it does mythical. Symbolism and nature, the method of Egyptian thought. From a modern Western perspective, their religion has been billed as primitive and polytheistic and appears as a mythological menagerie of gods. Nothing could be further from the truth. The source of this misunderstanding stems from the Egyptian word netter, being translated into Greek as god, which later took on the westernized meaning of deity. The true meaning of netter was to describe the, an aspect of deity, not a deity to be worshipped. In essence, netters refer to principles of nature in a practical scientific way. Yet the meaning of a specific netter was communicated in a visually symbolic manner. When a human was depicted with a, an animal head, this signified the principle as it occurred in man. If the whole animal was depicted, it was a reference to a principle in general. Alternatively, a human head depicted on an animal represents that principle as it relates to the divine essence within mankind, not any person in particular, but the archetypal as the immortal Ba is represented by a human-faced bird. Another example is Anubis, a jackal, who presided over the process of mummification. He did so as a representation of decomposition or fermentation process. In nature, the jackal keeps its prey and allows it to decompose before consumption. Therefore, he who presides over the mummification ritual was depicted in art as a man with the head of a jackal, thereby representing man's death as the digestive principle found in nature. From a universal perspective, the decomposition of a body is to nature digestion. Hence, those organs associated with digestion, after being removed from the deceased, were placed in a canopic jar with a lid shaped in the image of a jackal's head. 
before the pharaohs. The sudden emergence of dynastic Egypt at the beginning of the third millennium BC is one of civilization's greatest mysteries. How did this supposed primitive North African culture organize itself into a civilization of such magnificence? One aspect that I believe has been overlooked is that mankind, anatomically modern humans, has been around for a very long time. According to recent genetic studies, all people today are the descendants of a single African woman who walked the earth 150,000 years ago. According to geneticists, her mitochondrial DNA exists in all of us. This is a long time, 147,000 years, for our ancestors to have remained in a relatively primitive state. In my opinion, the evidence, some of which is incredibly anomalous, in particular the Great Pyramid, suggest they did not remain primitive. Given the evidence of ancient Egypt's technology, technical abilities, their monument, temples, and other crafts, artifacts still exist, as well as their sophisticated symbolism in describing nature, it appears that in establishing a dynastic society, the Egyptians of the 3rd millennium BC benefited from a legacy of knowledge. Skeptics of this approach to history, of course, would want to know where the evidence of the, this technical prehistoric civilization is. If such a civilization existed, surely there would be overwhelming evidence to support its existence. If an exclusively uniformitarian approach to geological formation were generally accepted as fact, I would agree with the skeptic. But mass extinctions as a result of environmental catastrophism because of volcanism, asteroid or comet impact, or stellar gamma radiation now seems to be a reality. According to geologists, there have been five large mass extinctions in Earth's history. The Ordovician, 440 to 450 million years ago. The Devonian, 408 to 360 million years ago. The Permian, 268 to 248 million years ago. The Triassic, 251 to 252 million years ago. The Cretaceous, 144 to 65 million years ago. And although all of these cataclysms occurred well before the modern human form, there are two global disasters. There are two global disasters that occurred relatively recently. Approximately 71,000 years ago, Mount Toba in Sumatra erupted, spewing an enormous amount of ash into the atmosphere. It was the largest volcanic eruption in the last two million years, nearly 10,000 times larger than the Mount St. Helens explosion in 1980. The resultant caldera formed a lake 100 kilometers long by 60 kilometers wide, with devastating and lasting climatic con consequences. A six-year-long volcanic winter followed, and in its wake an ice age that lasted for a thousand years. With its sulfuric haze, the volcanic winter lowered global temperatures, creating drought and famine, decimating the human population. According to geneticist estimates, the population was reduced to somewhere between 15,000 and 40,000 individuals. Professor of Human Genetics at the University of Utah, Lynn Jord, believes it may have been as low as only 5,000 people worldwide. Even closer to our time is a mysterious cataclysm at the end of the Ice Age only 10,000 years ago. No one really knows if it was the result of natural phenomena or asteroid impact. What is known is that the climate drastically altered life for those who lived at that time. It's known geological fact that at the end of the Ice Age, many North American species became extinct, including the mammoth, camel, horse, brown sloth, precarious pig-like hoofed animals, antelopes, American elephant, rhinoceros, giant armadillos, tapirs, saber-toothed tigers, and giant bison. It also affected the climates of lower altitudes in Central and South America, as well as Europe in a similar way. Those lands have also revealed evidence of mass extinction. Yet the mechanism that brought on this ice age ended cataclysm, this, a, this ice age ending cataclysm remains a mystery. If an ancient techn technical civilization existed during the remote past, what would be the likelihood of that civilization surviving a global catastrophe intact? Estimates from the Tobe eruption are not encouraging. Neither are the scenarios that astronomers and climatologists build today for a theoretical asteroid impact. According to the archaeological evidence, 
anatomical modern man, Cro-Magnon, appears in Western Europe 40,000 years ago, where they came from has been a long-standing mystery. The logical deduction is that they migrated from Africa. However, much such a migration requires a host culture of which there is no evidence. Nevertheless, a likely location for this host culture would have been along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, which were likely a series of freshwater lakes during the remote past. If ancient civilization existed in the region of the Mediterranean, it would not have survived the conflagration that turned those lakes into a saltwater sea. If that were indeed the case, the remnant of those who lived on the perimeter of that civilization would appear to us today as anomalies, such as the Giza pyramids and the giant stones of Baalbek. Cro-Magnon cultures of Western Europe, although once a part of a great Mediterranean civilization, would also appear as an anomaly. For us, it would be as if they appeared from nowhere. This is by Edward Molkowski, New Dawn magazine. It's on Humans Are Free, Creative Commons, by Alexander Light. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.